fruit normally only ripens once a year. And great apes, orangutans, chimps, gorillas only gain weight during fruit season. And that was one of the premises of my book and still is. If you want to gain weight, eat fruit. Um, yeah. That's what we do. So the new paper that came out shows that gorillas and chimps, when they eat fruit during fruit season, totally change their microbiome, number one. And number two, they begin digesting the mucus layer that protects the lining of our gut. Uh, the microbiome eats the mucus, and because they have nothing else to eat, they normally would eat the fiber and leaves, and when they eat fruit, that's gone, so they digest the mucus layer, and it's that mucus layer digestion that actually produces weight gain by these little particles called LPSs stimulating weight gain. Wow. Whoa. So number 254 with Stephen Gundry, the best-selling author of The Plant Paradox, The Plant Paradox Cookbook, and also a new book that's coming out in early 2019 called The Longevity Paradox. We talk about the concepts of all these books in this discussion today, which is brought to you by our friends over at perfectketo.com, the suppliers of high-quality exogenous ketones, MC2 oil powder, and a range of other blood sugar health support formulas. And as you know, they now have a new low-carb, high-fat, whole food-derived protein bar that is good if you're on a ketogenic diet because it's not going to affect your blood sugar levels. Since you listen to this YouTube channel and our, our podcast over on iTunes, is you can save 20% off on your next order by simply going to perfectketo.com forward slash H-I-H for high intensity health. Again, that URL is perfectketo.com forward slash H-I-H and at checkout, please use the promo code H-I-H. Now in today's show with Dr. Stephen Country, it's one of my favorite discussions from 2018. Why? Because we weave in so many different concepts and the ideas that we've been building upon as we've developed this channel over the last five years. So seasonal eating, the microbiome, exercise, circadian rhythms, and much more. It's a great discussion. Again, the books and the new books that Dr. Stephen Gundry has coming out are linked below. The show notes are there. And additional resources that I use to get up to speed to conduct this interview, including some you know journal articles that help me understand kind of how plants have their own defense mechanisms and may even be able to communicate with each other and communicate throughout the plant uh, when it becomes damaged. I know it's like a crazy thing to think about, but there are some research articles below that really got my mind thinking, and I hope it will inspire you to dive into it and start to think a little bit differently about how plants work and their defense mechanisms and how they communicate with each other. So with that, let's dive back into it with Dr. Gundry. We're good. Dr. Gundry, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. I've been wanting to have this conversation for a long time. Um, so lectins, you know, we've heard about this a little bit. Lauren Cordain, I think back in like 2008, he started talking about um, put, uh, lectins in tomatoes yep. and how they may affect the gut permeability in the context of autoimmunity, then I felt like the conversation kind of quieted down. Then your book really kind of got people thinking more about these anti-nutrients from vegetables. Um, so first, let's kind of start off like, uh, I know pe we're talking offline, like how people, you say something, but people don't really hear what you're saying. You're all about, you know, you're a plant-based guy primarily, right? Correct. But just like being more vigilant about which plants people have and consume. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. People, well, if they'd actually listened to me, know that I'm a confirmed plant predator. Yeah. And if you've ever had lunch or dinner with me, you know that basically all I eat is plants. Yeah. But the important thing is to realize what we were designed to eat, what our genetic makeup is designed to interact with, and also, probably more importantly, what our microbiome, our gut bugs, are designed to interact with. And I think the message is uh, that people have luckily taken to heart is there's cer certain plants that you're designed to eat that you interact with well that actually make you incredibly healthy. Mm -hmm. And then there's probably some plants in their babies that you probably should avoid because yeah. they don't have your best interest in heart. And in the books you talk about those, they're, they're veg we call them vegetables, but they're really more like fruits, like the zucchini, cucumber, and some others. Let's talk about, um, what, now, does Dr. Gundry eat those? No. Or, okay, <laughs> totally off the limit. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. there. Remember, for instance, zucchini squash family all came from the Americas, from North or South America, yeah. and you know so, some people here don't eat American food, and it's like, no, I didn't say that. 
What I said was there are certain plants that came from the Americas, North and South America, that none of our ancestors ever ate until 500 years ago when Columbus started trade. Mm -hmm. All of us are from Europe, Asia, or Africa, so that none of us were actually exposed to a lectin-containing plant from the Americas until 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite expressions is getting to know a new lectin in 500 years is speed dating and evolution. <laughs> and I don't think it can be done. Yeah. What about the idea, and this is emerging, that low-dose exposure to lectins may be beneficial as yeah. like an immune stimulus of sorts? Yeah, um, and I talked about that in my first book, Dr. Yeah. Gundry's Diet Evolution, that hormesis, so this small dose of poison, mm -hmm. is probably very beneficial. And I completely agree with that, and that's why in part three of The Plant Paradox, I actually ask people, okay, reintroduce these little doses and let's see how we do. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happened since kind of when I first started all this 17 years ago, I've half of my patients have autoimmune disease and uh, they've sought me out. And what I found with those people is, in general, you cannot probably ever reintroduce these guys. Mm -hmm. There is such a uh, sensitivity to these compounds yeah. that you can't get away with it, sorry. Yeah. So allergies, <clears throat> autoimmunity, but if someone's relatively healthy, active, yeah. they can maybe have a heirloom tomato salad once a month or something along those lines, just watch symptoms? Is that kind of the... Yeah, but you know, it's, it's interesting. When I, uh, when I go uh, particularly to, to uh, Italy and the south of France, um, I'll see a uh, plate of uh, crudities um, and the cucumbers will be peeled and de-seeded. I went to Istanbul for a lecture last year, and my salad was brought to me with peeled and de-seeded tomatoes and peeled and de-seeded cucumbers. And you go, wow, I guess they must have known I was in town. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's actually how they not do the it. case. That's how they do it. So they've, they've learned, what I like to do is study cultures yeah. and figure out, okay, why did they do this? What, what did they know? Um, that's brilliant. So inherently, I mean, people realize that maybe they got digestive symptoms or whatever. And so what is it about the seeds or the skin and, and w those attributes that make them, uh, for lack of a better word, pathogenic to humans? Well, that's the protective system of that particular plant to protect its babies. And we were talking off camera that plants basically have two systems of protecting their babies. There's a lot of plants that want you to eat their fruit. Yeah. And they protect the seed with a hard external shell that's indigestible. So for instance, a flax seed, we cannot digest it. Uh, a sesame seed, we can't digest. A poppy seed, we can't digest. And the plant actually wants you to eat those seeds or its predator, and those seeds will pass through your gastrointestinal tract and you'll deposit them with a generous dollop of fertilizer someplace else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an apple seed, uh, the apple tree wants you to eat its fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I talk in The Plant Paradox, it wants to tell you when its babies are protected by the color of the fruit that it's ripe, the baby's protected and please eat me. Mm -hmm. And it wants to warn you if the baby's not uh, ready to be eaten to make you sick like what I call the green apple two-step uh, mm -hmm. when we used to eat green apples and yeah. get diarrhea. So that's one plant system. Please eat my fruit because mm -hmm. you're going to deposit my babies. But the other plant system is I don't have a protective system on the outside of my seed so I'm going to put the protection inside the seed in the form of lectins which is going to make you ill, either make you feel bad, get you depressed. I mean, we can inject lectins into animal bellies and they will get so depressed and anxious, they will hide in a corner and not come out and seek food. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. So yeah. that's to dissuade an animal not to eat this. So the grains, the beans, what I call naked babies mm -hmm. in the book, they have the protection system within the seed itself. Other plants use the external system. I see. That's They're pretty smart. 
Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, your book really took me down this rabbit hole of research in plant biology and the mechanisms. And there's even um, some papers talking about the conscious of the plants and that they're thinking and the memory. And uh, so going back to Italy, right? So you go back there and you might have the de-seeded cucumber or tomato salad. But it makes me think that, well, two things that you mentioned, um, the, the external color of the fruit, right? And we circumvent that process with excellent, uh, what is it, ethylene oxide? Mm -hmm. And so then we're, it looks right, but really the lectin content is higher. Correct. And so those of us that are having like mangoes in December, right, things like that, that's going to be a high lectin fruit because it's out of season. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing, there's a paper that just came out actually this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it's actually kind of a segue on to yeah, this. Yeah, let's do it, yeah. So um, we know that uh, gorillas and great apes only gain weight once a year during fruit season. And it was actually one of the revelations of my first book. Uh, my editors didn't believe me. They said, fruit ripens all the time in the jungle. And I, well, actually, no. Fruit only ripens once a year, even in the jungle. Now, fruit ripens all year round now because we've hybridized it. And, or we can go to Chile you know, during our off season. But fruit normally only ripens once a year. And great apes, orangutans, chimps, gorillas only gain weight during fruit season. And that was one of the premises of my book and still is. If you want to gain weight, eat fruit. Um, yeah. That's what we do. Right. So the new paper that came out shows that gorillas and chimps, when they eat fruit during fruit season, totally change their microbiome, number one. And number two, they begin digesting the mucus layer that protects the lining of our gut. Uh, the microbiome eats the mucus, mm. and because they have nothing else to eat, they normally would eat the fiber and leaves, and when they eat fruit, that's gone, so they digest the mucus layer, and it's that mucus layer digestion that actually produces weight gain by these little particles called LPSs stimulating weight gain. Wow. Whoa. That is super fascinating. I mean, we've known about this in humans, but to see that, uh, you know, the mechanisms unveiled in animals is super fascinating. Yeah. So it's really, uh, it's not so much the calories or maybe the fructose, it's really the, the, the fruit ingested changes in the microbiome that's causing inflammation, really. Yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's and crazy. that's why we're only supposed to eat fruit once a year. Yeah. Because we used it, as the great apes did, to gain weight. Because mm -hmm. the rest of the year there wasn't much food. And for instance, orangutans, a crazy point, a female orangutan only comes into heat at the end of fruit season when she gains about eight pounds. And that is the stimulus that she's got enough weight to carry a baby. So amazing, <laughs> gosh. So uh, let's say you do a hard workout, right, in Santa Barbara Hills or something like that. Um, a lot of people have a, like a post-workout smoothie with some berries, half a banana, maybe some vegan protein powder. Would you recommend that? Yeah, there's some pretty good studies that mm -hmm. show a small amount of glucose uh, right about 15 minutes after a workout will allow protein to be delivered to muscle cells better than if you didn't have that small amount of glucose. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take much. Yeah, so don't overdo it. Right. Yeah, okay. So it's okay to eat out of season just in moderation is kind of the message? Well, for instance, I would rather not even do that part. Yeah. I'd rather get my glucose from, um, there'll be plenty of glucose, believe it or not, in a resistant starch, like some jicama, mm -hmm. like uh, a green banana. I, I see. I'm uh, kind of from the Ron Rosedale school of yeah. theory that uh, there's nothing wrong with starches as long as they're slowly delivered. Yes, I like his work. He's coming out with a book soon too, I think, Ron. You know, he might be, it's been a long time. Yeah, I remember, do you know Robert Crayon or the past Robert Crayon? He was in that era um, in the you know, kind of mid 2000s. Anyway, uh, so getting back to plants. So plants have this innate intelligence. And so I was wondering too, so going back to Italy, um, probably smaller farms, you know, growing these tomatoes and things like that. They're off the vine. They're not sitting in a truck going 3,000 miles. So is that part of it too? Um, is the, the plants have more time to create these anti-nutrients that are harmful for us because of how the food's being delivered to us in 21st century lifestyle? Well, 
part of the whole problem is we've, uh, among other things, genetically engineered tomatoes to be insect resistant. We actually, most tomato, commercial tomatoes in this country have had a lectin added to the tomato wow. to uh, produce more lectins. And lectins, again, are the defense system against insects. So, I mean, through the miracle of genetic engineering, we've actually increased the lectin content of tomatoes and also of corn. Corn, uh, the genetically engineered corn is Bt corn. And it is actually put a snowdrop lectin gene in, and snowdrop lectin is a really lethal le lectins to humans, mm. but it's also really lethal to insects. And so we've genetically engineered these wonderful products so we don't have to spray them with insecticides, but then we ingest the lectins. So, yeah. wow. Ouch. You explained a lot, you know, because some people say they'll go to Europe and have the chips or the bread or the whatever. And they're like, I have no problems. But then they have the same stuff here, even if it's organic, and they have horrendous GI issues or autoimmune flares and all that. So that could be one of the mechanisms. Yeah, so you can, um, it's really interesting. <laughs> Recently, uh, my book came out in Polish, yeah. and uh, I got interviewed by a, a bunch of Polish radio stations uh, in English, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the problems they're seeing right now is that uh, Roundup uh, is now owned by Bayer Corporation. Bayer uh, bought Mon Monsanto. Mm -hmm. And they now have passed in the U EU the use of Roundup. Oh, and sure. they were just aghast that because Bayer is this monster corporation in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, they're now able to manipulate the legislatures in Europe in the EU to you know, get this product into Europe. So mm -hmm. I think we're gonna see in the next few years um, a real problem. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, there's a really good restaurant in, in Santa Barbara, fairly new, chef came down from San Francisco. He's got a great pizza and so I wanted to meet the chef mm -hmm. and we're talking and because I said, you advertise that you use Italian flour. Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, we, we import all our flour from Italy. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, this is great, you know, because it's probably safe. And he says, e no. Wow. And I said, what? He says, well, Italy can't grow enough flour anymore, uh, wheat. Mm. So we, Italy imports wheat from the United States now, grinds it, and then sends it back to us. And he says, it breaks my heart, he says, because people don't know that when I tell them it's Italian flour, mm. it's not Italian flour, it's American flour. That and is a shame. Yeah. Isn't that happening with olive oil too? Yeah, there's, yeah. very true. Yeah. Uh, there's tons of olive oil that's adulterated, um, unfortunately. Mm. So you gotta know who your olive oil producer is. So, Luckily, I spend a lot of time in Europe and buy it over there, but there's several very safe producers in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, California Olive Ranch is actually okay. a very safe producer. Um, uh, there's, it's been profiled in a funny book called Extra Virginity, oh, okay. which is the story of the uh, you know, pollution of olive oil. Mm -hmm. There's also another great California company called Biryani. Mm -hmm. um, so, Really okay. safe producers. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. Those are really good tips. Um, so olive oil has hydroxytyrosol and other polyphenols. Are these um, considered anti-nutrients or defense molecules for the plants? Because in the health world, we think polyphenol, antioxidant, it's healthy. But really, aren't they lectin-like in some fashion? Or They're actually sunburn protection. Mm. Um, they're protecting the plant against sunburn. And fascinatingly enough, the higher in altitude a plant grows, its fruit has far more polyphenol content because you're closer to the sun. Mm -hmm. That's why high altitude uh, red berries. wines mm -hmm. uh, or berries mm -hmm. are actually far better for you than lower altitude. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a protection mechanism against sunburn for the plant. So not necessarily insects or bugs. So it's okay for humans. Oh yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, olive oil has some of the most protective properties there are. Mm -hmm. And Max Lukaver and I, in our podcast uh, a couple months ago when Max's book came out, yeah. we're talking about how the polyphenols in olive oil actually stimulate neural, neuron growth. Mm. And uh, this was actually proved in humans in a study in Spain. They took 65-year-old uh, people, mm -hmm. divided them into three groups, 
one had to use a liter of olive oil per week. That's about 12 tablespoons a day. Wow. Second group ate the equivalent calories in walnuts, and the third group ate a low-fat Mediterranean diet. They were followed for five years, and the initial study was for memory. Mm -hmm. The olive oil group and the walnut group had improved memory at the age of 70 than they did at age 65. Mm -hmm. The low-fat Mediterranean group had diminished memory, hmm. typical of what you would think. Yeah. Uh, so it turns out that the polyphenols in olive oil, uh, which have been proved in animal studies to grow neurons, grow neurons in humans. Love that. That's really great. I mean, there's some research on olive oil, though, uh, going back to like the ape study that you mentioned, where uh, the fruit consumption changed the microbiome, digested the mucus layer, endotoxin comes in. Olive oil does seem to increase metabolic endotoxemia. At least it's been shown. Now, is that problematic, or do the polyphenols help mitigate that? But there is some interesting studies about that. So um, I think context is really important, you know, in, con in, in conjunction with a healthy, real diet, you know, not processed food and all that. Well, remember, I think the huge benefit of polyphenols mm -hmm. is that it actually changes and paralyzes the gut microbiome from preventing them from making uh, one of the worst toxins called TMAO. Mm. Uh, you, can, uh, you can ingest animal protein and your bacteria will produce a fairly nasty compound called TMAO that was highlighted by the Cleveland Clinic that damages the surface of your blood vessels. Mm -hmm. If you have the polyphenols from olive oil or the polyphenols from red wine, for instance, then you actually paralyze the mechanism of producing that toxin by bacteria. You don't kill the bacteria, you just paralyze their enzyme system. Wow, yeah. that's a great tip. Um, about the TMAO, so let me pause actually. I want to thank Max Lugavere because he is the reason why we're here. So ah. he introduced you to me. So thanks, Max. Really appreciate that. Um, going back to the TM, TMAO story, when that came out like 2013 or something, it was hot and then it kind of fizzled a little bit. Uh, interestingly, plant-based eaters tend to have lower levels of TMAO compared to meat-based eaters. Is that one of the reason why you, you try to favor people to have more kind of whole plant foods in their diet? Yeah, I think. Uh TMAO is an important part of this uh, puzzle on why plant-based diets probably have less coronary artery disease than people who have a meat-based diet. I think there's far more to it than just that factor, and I talk about this crazy sugar molecule in beef, lamb, and pork that we could maybe get into. Yeah. But uh, I think the real key is that plant-based diet eaters are killing the enzyme system in bacteria that would produce TMAO. Mm. And to the Cleveland Clinic's credit, when all this came out and they were saying, well, this proves that you should only eat plants, and people in that research group said, well, wait a minute. Um, the Mediterranean diet in general has a very low incidence of coronary artery disease. And they're eating fish, and they're eating prosciutto, and they're eating salami. Why aren't they getting coronary artery disease? Mm. So they said, huh, good question. So they went back and said, okay, well, the Mediterranean diet is full of olive oil, tons of polyphenols. In general, lots of fruits and vegetables, tons of polyphenols. And mm. oh, they drink red wine. Mm. And so they then took those compounds and in the lab prove that in fact you could take those compounds and still eat meat and you wouldn't make TMAO. Interesting. And, you know, and I, I have a great deal of respect for those researchers because they could have just said, you gotta eat plants, you can't have anything else. End of story. End yeah. of story. <laughs> yeah. But they said, oh, that's why. So mm. the polyphenols paralyze that process. Interesting. So do you drink wine yourself? I do, mm -hmm. whether I want to or not. Yeah. So just a small amount with dinner kind of thing? Is that yeah, mm -hmm. and one of the things, you know, we have to learn studying cultures why they do certain things. Yeah. And clearly the culture, uh, particularly in the Mediterranean or in Europe for, for the most part, is wine is a beverage that you consume during a meal. And it's not the before happy hour, mm -hmm. uh, you know, two hours of cocktails <laughs> and, and then eat, yeah. uh, when, you know, which is a very American way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And the 
it looks like the consumption of wine with the meal is part and parcel with having those polyphenols in your system when, for instance, you're going to consume fats or have potential endotoxemia going mm -hmm. on. And if you notice in, in my book, during mm -hmm. the first two weeks of the starting phase, I actually try to get most fats out of people because I want to prevent that endotoxemia mm -hmm. from happening. I see. That's a beautiful point. So just uh, now with wine, like you mentioned glyphosate and Roundup and all that, we know that wine is, or grapes in general are sprayed pretty heavily. So yeah. uh, help us navigate, like, where do we buy wine? What do we look for? Yeah, I know. The really sad thing, the, the studies have come out that, unfortunately, glyphosate is in almost all American wines, at least California wines. Uh, even some of the organic wines, the fields next to the organic fields have been sprayed with Roundup and they've leached over. Uh, I support a lot of uh, California and Washington State wineries. However, I got to tell you, most of the wine I consume is from Italy and France and uh, from Argentina, from high elevation that are biodynamic or organic. And, it's fascinating to me, the European winemakers have moved almost exclusively to at least organic, and so many of them are biodynamic. Nice. And it's just fascinating uh, what happens to the wines. Oh, it's, it's more complex. The flavors are br brought out. Yeah, you, you think that it would be, I mean, I, I'm not a grape grower, right? But you'd think that would be the, the best way to do it. I mean, it's, that's what's been done for years, using bugs that are predatory for other bugs in different microclimates. I mean, it's really fascinating. There's a, uh, in Glen Ellen, my aunt has a place up there in, in, in the, near Napa, and uh, mm -hmm. I think it's not Benzinger, but Behringer. Yeah, yeah. Behringer. Have you been there on yeah, there, a little yeah, yeah. tour? Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, just seeing like all the different microclimates. Um, all right, so let's go back a few things to uh, plant-based compounds like leucosinolates and sulforaphane and all that. Um, low dose, good, high dose, good or bad? Um, Great question. In fact, uh, I'm writing an article this weekend for a magazine uh, on sulfur compounds and whether they're great or not. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, you know, there's about 40 different sulfur-containing compounds in, for instance, the brassica vegetables, and sulfur uh, is a, is a fantastic, interesting element. There's sulfur looks so much like a carbon atom that there are theories that probably somewhere in the universe there is a sulfur-based life form instead of a carbon-based life form mm -hmm. because they're very interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Sulfur is, is critical for mitochondrial functioning, for producing glutathione, which we know is at the end the ultimate free radical oxygen scavenger. It makes glutathione. You can't make glutathione without sulfur. Mm -hmm. and there are some interesting theories that sulfur deficiency is a real thing in poor health. Uh, so the brassica family of vegetables, the cruciferous vegetables, for instance, uh, also onions and garlic have large amounts of sulfur in them. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, Pellegrino, San Pellegrino water, has the highest sulfur content of any known water. Cool. And I only drink San Pellegrino water, yeah. so. Interesting. So it's, it's more of a positive than a negative? I, I think so. Okay. Yeah. But would it be considered a defense molecule made by the brassica plants to prevent herbivory? Or yeah, uh, it, it definitely is. And again, this may be hormesis. Yeah. I think what happens is it's virtually impossible for us to eat that much of these vegetables. Yeah. Although, just a word of warning, I have seen a couple of people, and literally a couple, who have gone on these crazy kale kicks, and it's yeah. kale for breakfast, kale for lunch, kale for dinner, and uh, they begin to get hypothyroid. Mm. And when I back them off on their kale, uh, their thyroid recovers. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a personal story yeah. about kale. I love it. So, um, years ago, you remember when the Nutribullet came out? Yes. Uh, in fact, I lectured at David Wolf's con oh, conference cool. at Longevity Now a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And so, uh, we bought a Nutribullet. Mm -hmm. My wife 
you know, went crazy and said, we're gonna have kale smoothies, yeah. you know, every, every time. We eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables and eat kale, but we eat kale salads. Mm -hmm. and, as a side, I have an amazing kale salad in the Plant Paradox Cookbook Awesome. that was made by Jonathan Waxman, mm -hmm. the James Beard Award-winning chef from Jams and Barbudo in New York City. Hello, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, cool. And he gave us the, the recipe. Anyhow, yeah. so I, ate a lot, I eat a lot of kale salad. Yeah. So my wife takes you know, a ton of kale and puts it in the Nutribullet mm -hmm. and makes a kale smoothie. So I'm very tolerant to kale if I'm eating it you know, and chewing, chewing, and, yeah. and so I drink that kale smoothie mm -hmm. and and head off to work. Well, two hours later, you know, stomach's rumbling, and a couple hours later, I blow out diarrhea, and I mm -hmm. go, "What the heck is that all about?" Yeah. Well, what had happened was the Nutribullet had homogenized all of these wonderful nasty little compounds in kale. Mm. I was the giant insect, mm -hmm. and that kale was interacting with my GI tract, mm -hmm. uh, and my GI tract said, holy cow, there's some lethal compounds in here, and we gotta get it out. Yeah. So even though I was tolerant to kale, if I would digest it slowly, as if I was chewing leaves, mm -hmm. when my wife uh, you know, pulverized it, it released all those compounds, and even me, boom, out it went. Amazing. Well, it speaks to a few different things. Uh, the robustness of kale. I grow kale. We have like 400 square feet of garden space. And the only thing, I live in Seattle. Mm. And last winter, we had a ton of uh, snow and stuff like that. The only thing standing in the spring was kale. So it's, I, I have a newfound respect for it, but also realize that those leaves are pretty tough. Like, you got to marinate it with olive oil if you do a salad. So I want to get your recipe. Um, so yeah, it's great. But uh, the other thing, the preparation of food can kind of change how it affects your body. And I think a lot of people just look at food as just the macros and they don't worry about if it's boiled or baked or steamed or whatever. Um, so uh, along those lines, if we're eating a, you know, a lot of plants in our diet, is there a preferred method of cooking to kind of minimize the uh, lectin and antinutrient exposure? Yeah, great question. So you know, I see a lot of people with irritable bowel, leaky gut. Yeah. And really raw vegetables, particularly raw cruciferous vegetables or raw dark leaf vegetables, uh, have these compounds that are incredibly irritating to someone who doesn't have a good mucosal barrier in their gut. So those folks, I just say, please, don't, don't eat stuff raw initially. Yeah. I want you to eat raw eventually. I eat probably about 85% of my food raw. Mm. I was a raw foodist for nine months, probably had the best, best health I ever had, but it's totally impractical long term. Yeah. Uh, as most even raw food chefs eventually abandon it. Um, mm. and just all nope. the soaking and dehydrating, yeah, all it's that? Yeah, just timely. incredible work, and yeah. if you're traveling, um, you're yeah. carrying stuff with you. You're, you know, I used to, you know, get off the plane and head to a, you know, a, a Whole Foods to stock up to go to my hotel room, and it's yeah. like, this is really dumb. Yeah. Um, so I, I eat about 85% raw. But back yeah. to the subject, yeah. those folks, you really want to stay away from these plant compounds because they are the defense system of the plant. Yeah. Cooking makes all the difference. And some people, I just have to basically have them nuke it down to soups and things like that early on. Uh, a pressure cooker is one of the greatest inventions of all time. The modern one, like an instant pot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one, one button and, yeah. and away you go. So yeah, it's important. And there's other things that are really important. Getting back to, for instance, some of the compounds in broccoli or cauliflower. It turns out that the chewing process or the cutting process, chopping these things, release the actually bioactive compounds far better than if you don't chew it or chop it. And there's, there's compounds in cruciferous vegetables that hit what's called the A receptor, the AHR receptor on the lining of our gut cells. And these are specialized uh, white blood cell, immune cells that actually sense what you just ate. And there's compounds in chopped broccoli or chewed raw broccoli you know, or cauliflower that actually hit these little receptors and say, it's okay, what you're about to eat is, is really good for you and you should relax and not sound the alarms. And 
Michael Greger makes a really good point of this in some of his videos that chopping or chewing uh, raw broccoli or raw cauliflower will be actually beneficial to your immune system sensing whether it should react to the food you eat or not. Now, I take compounds that do that. They're called DIM, D-I-M, mm -hmm. that do that. So I take a capsule several times a day. Nice. And for its immune modulating effect. Correct. Yeah, so that whole field of immune tolerance. And so a lot of people are just intolerant to what they're eating. Then they get flare-ups, you know, allergies, asthma, autoimmunity, et cetera. So that's cool. The, what's that, the acylcarbon, acylhydrocarbon receptor? Yeah, I yeah, remember reading yeah. something along those lines. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Great tip there. Um, one of the nutrients I wanted to kind of pick up, I have all these in my head, uh, <laughs> essential oils and tannins. Can we talk about tannins? Because those are a nutrient in red wine. Are they an anti-nutrient? Or? Yeah, so a tannin is another protective system of the plant. Um, there's a lot of tannins, for instance, in red wine. That's that terrible mouthfeel you, you feel when there's a high tannin content. Uh, I have a dear uncle who's 91 years old who to this day gets a violent headache whenever he gets high tannin red wine. Mm. And it, it's driven him crazy all his life. I have a number of people who clearly the tannins in red wine will stimulate a migraine headache. Uh, the people who really react to walnuts, uh, it's the tannin in the coating of the walnut that uh, will actually cause burns in their mouth. Mm. So it's another defense system of yeah. the plant. And, and like you say, plants have had you know, 400 million years to work all this out. Totally. And they are, they are sentient beings, and we have to understand that. Yeah. That's a, yeah, you provide a compelling argument. And I love what you call yourself a, a plant predator, right? So, so we're all plant predators, and yeah. whether we know it or not, if we eat vegetables, right? Um, so essential oils are hot right now, or they have been for a while. Um, what lectin content, anti-nutrient content in essential oils? You, you really, the essential oils are, are, are pretty useful. Um, for instance, uh, one of my uh, assistants uh, gets migraine headaches and she just thinks lavender oil is the best thing that ever happened to her. I think we do have to be careful with some of the essential oils because it's beginning to appear that there are compounds in essential oils that are probably anti-nutrients and I think you can go overboard with anything yeah. and just be cautious. Mm -hmm. What about chocolate? Oh, it's the best thing that you could possibly eat. Yes. <laughs> uh, now, the, the key with chocolate is two things. Yeah. Um, chocolate became popular after the Dutch figured out how to bind the polyphenols in chocolate, which are the bitter compounds. And to this day, it's still called Dutching. They combined alkali with chocolate to cut the bitterness, and that actually created what is the modern chocolate. Mm. You can find cocoa powder that is non-Dutch or non-alkali, and you always want to look for that on the label. Mm -hmm. Chocolate, I eat chocolate every day. Um, I have a big square of 90% or even 100% chocolate uh, every day. Believe it or not, Trader Joe's now has 100% chocolate called Montezuma mm. uh, with cocoa nibs in it. I chew a handful of cocoa nibs mm -hmm. uh, every day. Uh, the polyphenols in chocolate make your brain cells grow. They're amazing polyphenol. Yeah. Don't be afraid of them. Totally. Um, your microbiome must be very diverse. I <laughs> hope so. Uh, and, you know, it, it, that's a good point. You really, one of the things as we start studying, um, for instance, hunter-gatherers like the Hansa, we know that they have an incredibly diverse microbiome. And what's fascinating, and this is part of my next book, the microbiome changes by the season. And I'm convinced that that circadian rhythm, that seasonal uh, rhythm, is really important for our long-term health. And when you, when you look at cultures that have great longevity, and we could talk about them, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things they do is they change their diet seasonally. And we're beginning to realize that the microbiome changes seasonally, and thanks a lot to the study of the Hansa. Uh, and I think that change in the microbiome has direct effects on the wall of our intestines. And there's just really cool research that the way we treat the wall of our intestine, the gut wall, 
is going to determine how long we're going to live, number one, and how well we're going to live yeah. during that time. That's a great point. Um, what are your favorite tests, or, or do you have any, for testing the integrity of the wall? So um, we use a lot of blood tests to look uh, for leaky gut. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's easy to do that uh, is fairly available now is just get zonulin uh, measured. Mm -hmm. But I look at uh, TNF-alpha in all my patients. Uh, it's a pretty good marker, believe it or not, of how many lectins they're eating. Mm. Uh, next week at the American Heart Association meeting in San Francisco, I'm going to give a paper for the first time showing that lectins are probably a major contributor to coronary artery disease mm. and removing lectins from the diet reverses an autoimmune attack on our coronary arteries. It's pretty exciting stuff. Wow, so is that the mechanism of action of what we call atherosclerotic plaque? It's yeah. like an autoimmune mediated. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Michael DeBakey, yeah. uh, one of the fathers of heart surgery from Houston, Texas, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, used to say that cholesterol has nothing to do with uh, heart disease, with atherosclerosis, that it's an innocent bystander that gets trapped up in this war on the blood vessel wall. And uh, everybody said, oh, come on, everybody knows that cholesterol causes this problem. Well, when I like to talk to my patients about, let's suppose I'm, a, I'm an alien who's been sent down to observe life on Earth and I'm orbiting the planet and I'm sending back my observations to high command. One of the observations I could make orbiting the planet is that I've been watching things uh, here in Los Angeles and I'm certain that ambulances cause car accidents because every time I see an ambulance, there's a car accident. So I have made the association that ambulances cause car accidents. Well, no, ambulances are associated with car accidents, uh, but they don't cause it. They're the result of the car accident. So what I think has happened that Michael DeBakey described you know, 60 years ago yeah. is that cholesterol is basically an ambulance that has arrived at the scene of an accident, a war on the wall of the blood vessel and the poor ambulance is trapped up in the war and it's part of the debris that's there. Mm -hmm. So association is not causation. And what a great analogy. Mm -hmm. People are gonna listen to that a few times and be like, I love that. And then talk, when people blame cholesterol, love that. So uh, does particle size, do you like to look at like ApoB yeah. and small dense particles? And yeah, I don't, I don't like ApoB. Uh, ApoB was developed early on as a way of accounting for all particles of LDL, whether it was small or, or big. Mm -hmm. We now can not only fractionate into small particles and big particles, but uh, I go a further test and look at whether those are oxidized or not. Mm -hmm. And cholesterol is not bad for you, yeah. quote unquote, unless it's oxidized, unless it's rancid or rusty. And then it has the potential to get involved in this process. So one of the things that's been interesting that I've reported on is that polyphenols prevent the oxidation of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Love that. That's amazing. Um, I think Cleveland Clinic is the, one of the only labs that is looking at oxidized LDL. Is that right? Do no, uh, there's actually several. Okay. Vibrant America looks at oxidized LDL. Mm -hmm. True Health looks at oxidized LDL. Okay. It's a tough test. Um, I actually use two labs, uh, mm. both that I mentioned simultaneously because... You want to make sure they're I, honest. Yeah, I want to make sure, because it, it's a tough test to do, and a lot yeah. of labs don't want to do it because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just a tough test to do. Yeah. All right, a few final questions here. I know you got a busy schedule, um, but you talked about there's a, a, a glucose molecule in meat that we wanted to get to earlier, and I just wanted to make sure we talk about that. So uh, what are your thoughts on, like, red meat? Yeah. So, you know, there is an association with consuming red meat and increased cancer and actually increased heart disease. And uh, those are actually good, valid associations. But why is not too clear. Years ago, um, 
when I was a transplant immunologist at Loma Linda, uh, I was investigating pig to baboon heart transplants, and I hold the world record for that. Um, but there was a molecule in the blood vessel of pigs, a sugar molecule, mm -hmm. called NU5GC, and, and there won't be a test, um, that we violently reacted to uh, from our bloodstream because we have a sugar molecule in our bloodstream that we share with fish and chickens called NU5AC. Mm. Now, NU5AC looks almost identical to NU5GC. It changes, there's one chemical bond difference. But because of that very close similarity, we make an autoantibody to NU5GC, and we actually can attack our blood vessels in an autoimmune attack if we consume beef, pork, or lamb, which contain NU5GC. The other interesting thing is that tumors use NU5GC to hide from our immune system. And human tumors have large amounts of NU5GC. What's weird is we have no ability to manufacture NU5GC. Mm. So that means the tumors within us got the NU5GC from beef, lamb, or pork. Wow. Which hmm. now comes full circle to say, holy cow, no wonder beef, lamb, and pork consumption is correlated with heart disease and cancer. And it's because of this crazy sugar molecule. Hmm. So it's found within the, the meat itself? No, or? It's actually found in the blood vessels of the meat, and of course oh, the blood yeah. vessels are throughout the meat. Gosh, that's amazing. I'm about to dive more into that. Thanks for sharing that. That's super fascinating. But you identified this or knew about this a long time ago, just the yeah, connection. I, I knew about yeah. this in the 90s when wow. we were researching transplant rejection. Crazy. And it's funny, when I was writing The Plant Paradox, yeah. I, you know, I, all of a sudden, one day it was kind of popped in my head, and I, I called my editor and I said, stop. Uh, I said, can we delay publication? I, 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 I'm flying to New York right now. I'm going to show you this research. And I said, I forgot all about it, but look, here's this connection. And so I flew to New York. My editor said, this is really crazy. Okay, we're actually going to hold the book, write this up, and we're going to put it in the book. Wow. It's that important. That's amazing. For the new book that's coming out. Soon. No, this was for oh, the good. Plant Paradox. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. We actually waited about two months for me to finish yeah. this part. It must have been tough to, because, you know, book launches are planned yeah. years in advance, uh, right? Um, okay, let's talk a few final questions here. I know you got to run. Um, the lectins within meat, right? So let's say a pig or a cow or a lamb, whatever, is eating grains that are rich in lectins. <clears throat> As eater, consumers of that muscle flesh, are we getting the lectins? You know, it's something I really didn't want to believe. Um, it's something that I said, oh, come on, this is so far-fetched. Yeah. Uh, but it was... In some of the alternative medicine literature that you are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. And it wasn't really until I had a woman who I talk about in the book, who's a psychologist here in Los Angeles, who had lupus. And we got her off of all her lupus meds, her lupus cleared, except that she had this little bit of eczema in, in her eyelids. And that was the only thing left. And I'm going, yeah, this is interesting. You know, all your other you know, rashes are gone. You're off of your meds. I wonder what it is. And we're going down the list. And I said, now, you're eating pastured poultry. And she said, oh, yeah, I eat organic free range. Mm -hmm. And you know, my eyes lit up. And I went, wait a minute. That's not pastured poultry. Uh, she said, it isn't? I said, no, pastured, you know, they're out eating bugs. Yeah. Uh, organic free range, they kept in a warehouse and fed organic corn and organic soybeans. Mm. So I said, let's do a little experiment. I said, give up chicken and call me back. About a month goes by, she calls me back, she said, eczema's gone. Wow. And I said, whoa. And so that was actually the first actual human mm. that taught me that this is real. I've subsequently had a no number of, particularly women, who it's the you know, organic free-range chicken that they're eating, or even the organic buffalo that they're eating. Most buffalo in the United States is fed uh, grains, corn, and soybeans, even if it says organic. And when we finally got those things and got them 
grass-fed and grass-finished meats that we finally lost the markers for autoimmune disease. It was that last piece. And I wouldn't have believed it. I mean, it yeah. just sounds so crazy. It does, a little bit. But yeah, I mean, these, these anecdotal stories are how we gather data and yeah. hypotheses yeah. and so forth. Amazing. So three final questions we've asked every guest on the show. First of all, is there anything about the new cookbook, any recipe highlights you want to share with people? Because I know it's, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But uh, what are, like you mentioned, the kale salad. What are a few other things that people may want to check out? Well, I mean, for instance, what we want to do in the cookbook is give people a way to eat food that is good for you, but also tastes good. In other words, food you love that loves you back. And that's really what we want. And so it was really designed for, you know, two income families, you're working all day, you gotta get the kids to, you know, 27 soccer practices. And the last thing you wanna do is cook. And it's easier to pick up a pizza or a bucket of chicken. And you know it's not right, but you know, you're exhausted. So we wanted to put together recipes that are quick to do that are lectin limited or lectin free that will actually take care of your health. And that's really the, the emphasis for the book. People have really embraced the concept of getting rid of lectins, their health has improved, but then they said, okay, what do I eat? Um, so, I mean, we've got waffles, we've got cookies. My wife just made lemon poppy seed cake uh, last week and we had guests over and they go, oh my gosh, can I have another slice? That's awesome. And <laughs> That's great. A lot of people that tune into the show are like low carb keto type people. Is there some stuff in there for them? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think uh, Ron Rosedale was smart enough to realize, uh, he was an ultimate low carb guy. Yeah. And he realized almost simultaneous with, with me when I think both of us were confronted by the Kitavans or the Katavans who eat a very high carb diet as well as the Okinawans. 85% of their diet is a purple sweet potato. And yet these guys have thriving health. And you go, well, you know, all these carbohydrates. What's important to realize is the type of carbohydrates you eat is whether or not it's going to feed bacteria, which are actually going to eat that carbohydrate. And one of the keys from my book, and you'll see in the next book on longevity, is you have to eat for your bacteria, not for you. And part of my problem with a lot of the keto advice and a lot of the paleo advice is you're actually not eating for the 90% of the organisms that make you and me, me, and that's our microbiome. And so every day I eat for my microbiome and they'll take care of me. And, and I'm always remembered of Jack LaLanne, uh, probably one of the greatest actually sports and nutritionist uh, person in the world, always said, if it tastes good, spit it out. <laughs> That's a great point. But you're right, a lot of people in the low carb or paleo space are, are having like uh, MCT powders, like a main staple in their diet. But what is that doing for their microbiome? And so, it, you know, I think it's a great way to kind of look at things. And along those lines, uh, we have a few final questions for you. One, what's one herb, nutrient, or botanical that is congruent with that paradigm, you know, for supporting the microbiome for your own health that you just couldn't live without? So if you're stranded on a desert island, omega-3s, vitamin D are covered. What's coming with you? Uh, well, you're not actually going to get enough vitamin D on a, on a desert island. I disagree with Dr. Mercola about that. Okay. You've got to supplement with vitamin D. Um, and we're beginning to realize that the more vitamin D, the better. Um, Dr. Hollick from Boston University has only seen one case of vitamin D toxicity in his life, and that was a doctor mm -hmm. who was taking a million international units a day for six months by mistake. Right, I remember hearing about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's very, very difficult to get vitamin D toxicity. Mm -hmm. The Mayo Clinic has issued a report that 60,000 international units a day for six months may produce vitamin D toxicity, but that's a lot. Yeah, you'd have to really You'd really have to try to yeah. produce it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what what can't you live without? Um, you you can't live without some way of feeding your microbiome. I happen to think that leaves are the best way to do that. You and I evolved from a leaf eating ape, so get yourself some leaves. If you don't have leaves, then I think tubers are by far the next choice. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite tuber? 
Uh, I actually love Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, I always have a supply, uh, sunchokes, uh, I always have a supply in my refrigerator that I keep forever. Awesome. That's great. Um, so we know successful people like yourself have a set of rituals to do in the morning uh, that set them up for success for the day. Can you briefly describe like what characteristics of your morning routine help you not only have good health and but make you more successful as an entrepreneur and educator and author? Uh, my ritual is determined by my dogs at 4.40 in the morning. Uh, one of my Labradoodles jumps on my face and says, okay, let's go. Uh, I have four dogs and we uh, hike about two and a half miles in the hills. And that's, if I don't do that, as my wife reminds me, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a dog walker. Mm -hmm. And if I get out in the hills and watch what my dogs do and in interacting with their environment, I'm good for the rest of the day. Good for you. So it's meditation, exercise, sunlight, yeah. you name it. That's awesome. All part of the package. Yeah. And walking against gravity. Um, yes, uphill. Yeah. You know, the more one of the one of the really interesting things about all of the blue zones is they live in hills. Uh, you know, I think we forget that. Yeah. The the effect of working against gravity is probably one of the most important things that we've forgotten. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So final question here, if you were to meet with a parliament member in Europe, because you know you travel quite a bit, some, a senator here in the States, in an elevator, you just had 30 seconds to share with them the biggest lifestyle or policy influencing tip about nutrition. What would you want them to know about, like in terms of big picture? Stop glyphosate. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. Dr. Gundry, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate this. Hey, thanks a lot. So you got the new cookbook that's out, came out April 11th or something like that? Yeah, it's been on the New York Times bestseller list for the last awesome. two weeks. Good uh, for you. Wall Street Journal number two of all nonfiction books. Amazing. So, yeah, we're really excited. Um, it's been met with warm applause. That's great. So I'll put that in the YouTube description below, guys, and in the show notes. And if someone's uh, walking their dog right now or driving and they want to connect with you, uh, I know you're big on Instagram, Facebook. Where? What's the one place they should go? So the portal is GundryMD.com, okay. and you can connect with us. You can get a daily newsletter. You can get connected to the YouTube channel. I'm nice. always putting out you know, tips and recipes. Yeah. I saw the interview you did with Max. That was good. Good guy. So thanks, Max, yeah. for that. Really appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks this was a lot. lot of fun. Appreciate it.